With the MCU being just three movies in and two of them being disappointing, it was really going to need its fourth film to deliver. Luckily for them, in my opinion at least, this movie did just that. And while I don't think Thor was a top tier MCU movie like Iron Man, it definitely wasn't bottom tier like Iron Man 2 or The Incredible Hulk. This, in my opinion, was the first solid mid-tier MCU movie. This movie's had a little bit of a weird history. It was originally looked at as pretty good when it came out, then it was looked at as pr even better when its crappy sequel came out, but then its second sequel came out which blew the first two out of the water. And yes, it is true, this is not a top tier MCU movie much like Ragnarok was. And obviously since this movie, the character of Thor has evolved a lot. However, I think because of Thor to Dark World, the mythological pre-hilarious Thor gets shit on a little bit too much. This movie was a good example of you can do Mythological 4 pretty damn well if you have the right story behind it. Not only did they have that, but they had an incredible cast. Chris Hemsworth not only looked the part of the title character, but provided a good mix of humor and charisma to boot. Of course, there was also Tom Hiddleston as Loki, who has been lauded as arguably the best villain in the history of the MCU. Idris Ilba, who played Hemondale, Rene Russo, who played Frigga, and Anthony Hopkins, who played Odin, all also did solid jobs in this movie as well. The only acting problems I actually had with this movie, well, were the human characters. This may be controversial, but I've never really been a fan of Natalie Portman's work. To be fair, the only things I've really seen her in, though, are this and Star Wars, and she was in this, and she was god-awful in Star Wars. And Kat Dennings, who played her dim-witted assistant Darcy, always gives off the impression to me that she's trying really hard to be funny, but she's not actually that funny. I think Stellan Skarsgård, who played Eric Selvig, did an alright job. He didn't really get a chance to show his personality, though, to a little bit later in the movie. And that right there, the human elements of this, is what you could argue keeps this from being a top-tier movie. Regardless of that, though, the plot was very solid, and it definitely gave the MCU the boost it needed. And that's why today, we're going to be taking a look back at what, in my opinion, is the MCU's first ever mid-tier movie, Thor. So the movie starts off with Jane Foster, Eric Selvig, and Darcy chasing a mysterious storm. They finally find what they were looking for, and Jane instructs Darcy to drive right towards it. Not wanting to die, however, Darcy tries to pull away from it. Jane, however, being a complete dick, grabs the wheel and tries to steer them right into the storm. And this was kind of one of my problems right off the bat. It's like, Jane is supposed to be a likable character. She's supposed to be the love interest. So what a way to introduce her, huh? As a complete dick who tries to murder her friends. Speaking of murder, it's time for some good old-fashioned vehicular manslaughter. After they accidentally knock the strange man down, they question where he came from. We'll get back to that later. It's time for a flashback. We now get told the story of the Great War between the King of Asgard and the Frost Giants. The Frost Giants come in all evil and stuff and they're like, freeze, bitch. But then King Odin comes in and he's like, nah, bitch, you freeze. Then they fight for a bit and the Frost Giants just lose. And then Odin's like, I, right, I'm bored. I'm gonna go home now. Turns out the whole time he was telling the story to his two young sons, Thor and Loki. They both seem ready to one day ascend to the throne, but Odin makes it clear that only one of them can end up being king. And ding 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 ding, cutting to the future, we have our winner. With Odin growing old, he's just about to make Thor king of Asgard until the Frost Giants make their return. Conveniently timed. Luckily, a giant guard called the Destroyer easily melts them. Thor and Odin then have a giant blow up over what action should be taken over this, while Loki just kind of stands there awkwardly. Thor wants to go to the Frost Giant's home of Jotunheim and tear them all down, but Odin rebukes him, telling him that he's not the king yet. And with that, we cut to a dramatic table flip. As the God of Thunder sits there and seethes, Loki is able to successfully gaslight him, and Thor convinces his friends, Sif and the Warriors Three, to help him go to Jotunheim and take down the Frost Giants. They have to get past the powerful gatekeeper Heimdall, though, and oh boy, this is not going to be any- oh wait, he's just going to let him go? Alright, well, never mind. They arrive in Jotunheim and confront Lawfully the king of the Frost Giants. After Lothly has him surrounded, though, he tells him to leave, which Loki accepts. Thor is about to follow Loki's lead, but unfortunately, Lothly throws one more insult on there that was not a good idea, and the fight is now on. And with the help of his trusty hammer Mjolnir, Thor proceeds to fuck shit up. The rest of his friends are kind of getting their ass kicked, but, I mean, at least Thor is fucking shit up, you know, the movie's about him, I guess. One of the Warriors 3 gets touched by the Frost Giants and lets his comrades know not to get touched by them because it freezes your arm. Loki gets touched by one, but interestingly enough, it doesn't do anything to him. One of the Warriors ends up getting impaled, though, and they sense it's time to leave. Thor doesn't agree, though, and he keeps fucking shit up. 
He fucks shit up so much that lawfully activates some kind of giant vorted boreal valley looking ass monster, which chases Loki and friends to the edge of the earth. Just as it's about to devour them though, the God of Thunder is here to save the day. And look at that, they got away from the frost out. No, no, there, there's a lot of them. There's still a lot of them. But never fear, King Odin is here. Odin tries to make peace, but lawfully says they're way beyond that. So Odin's like, screw it, I'm just gonna yeet my fam on out of here. And now it's time for Giant Argument 2, Electric Boogaloo. This one's a lot worse though. It's a lot worse to the point where Odin decides that Thor is incapable of being king, strips him of all his titles, including Mjolnir, and banishes him out of Asgard. And now just like that, we're back to the beginning of the movie with Natalie Portman committing vehicular manslaughter. Thor screams at the sky to let them back in, and Darcy just decides, screw it, I'ma tase him. They end up taking him to the hospital, which ends up being not such a good idea because he ends up beating up half the hospital, until they're able to inject him with sleepy time stuff. Meanwhile, back in the New Mexico desert, a random trucker stumbles upon a hammer that's been impaled in the ground. He can't lift it, however, curiously enough. Back in the nerd lab, the scientists are comparing their pictures of the storm, until they realize that Thor is right there inside the storm in one of the pictures. They go to the hospital to get him back, but but he has already escaped. Well, they're gonna need some serious luck to find him, but who needs luck when you have the power of vehicular manslaughter on your side? It's all fun back in the desert, meanwhile, as all the truckers, including Stan Lee, are having a barbecue and attempting to pull more near out of the ground. Hey, wait a minute, that car looks familiar. Well, it should. This is the end credit scene from Iron Man 2, and there's Agent Colston. Back on Asgard, Loki reveals to Sif and the Warriors that it was he who tattletailed on Thor to Odin. After he leaves, Sif and the Warriors begin to question if Loki's intentions are good after all. Loki seems to be struggling as well, as he's began to suspect who he really is. He confronts Odin on this, and Odin lets him know that he is indeed actually a frost giant. Not only is he a frost giant, but he's actually Lothly's biological son. Odin says that his original purpose for Loki was to unite Asgard and the frost giants, which pretty much sends Loki off the deep end. This is too much for Odin to handle though, as he has a heart attack and fucking dies. Thor and the Earthlings meanwhile are having lunch until they hear a trucker talking about a giant hammer that's been lodged in the desert. Thor decides to head there immediately, and Jane initially agrees to drive him there in exchange for information about who he is. Eric is able to talk her out of it though, citing Thor as dangerous, and they decide to part ways. Maybe she should have gone with him though, because back at her lab, Agent Colston is here to jack all her shit. They need her stuff because reasons, I guess, and they literally just take everything. They take her backups, they take her backups backups, they take her backups backups to her backups. Back in Asgard, Sif and the warriors are here to tattletale on Loki, but dun dun dun, guess who's sitting on the throne? Apparently Odin is not dead, but he's fallen into a deep Odin sleep, sort of a coma if you will. They plead Loki to allow Thor to return, which Loki refuses, making them very upset. Having lost all her shit, Jane decides to stalk Thor, who is going to a pet place looking for a horse. They don't have horses there, obviously, because it's a random pet store, but Jane rolls up and once again offers him a ride. Seems like Jane is catching feelings for Thor real quick, and to be fair, can you blame her? I mean, he's fucking beautiful. They arrive at the Hammer site, which has since been quarantined by S.H.I.E.L.D., and Thor breaks in and starts fucking up pretty much everybody. Looks like they got a sniper up top, though. Wait a minute, is that Hawkeye? Yes, it is. Even though his appearance was actually uncredited in this movie, this was Jeremy Renner's first appearance as Hawkeye. Thor finally meets his match with a big guard and they mud wrestle for a bit. However, he throws a perfect dropkick and is able to take him down like all the rest. Thor finally reaches the hammer, but when he tries to lift it, he is unable to, as he is no longer worthy. Depressed and defeated by this, Thor allows S.H.I.E.L.D. to arrest him. Agent Colston tries to interrogate him and he gives no answer, however Loki is here to pay him a visit as well. And Loki goes into professional manipulator mode, telling Thor that Odin has died as a result of Thor's banishment and Loki is now king of Asgard. He also tells Thor that he can't allow him to come home because his mother forbade it. God damn, Loki. Before he truly leaves Earth, Loki also tries to grab the hammer, but guess who else isn't worthy? That's right, you, you evil black-haired bastard. Luckily, however, the scientists have forged a plan, and they fake a story that Thor is just one of their colleagues. Somehow this works and Eric is able to get him out of there, but Agent Coulson has people keep eye on them. Eric and Thor agree to drink the night away, with the condition that Thor leaves in the morning. Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom, the Frost Giants have a visitor, and it's Loki. Loki comes in peace, however, and offers Lofi a deal to kill Odin and take his magical glowing box back. Having wanted this for so long, Lofi, without hesitation, accepts. Coming back to Asgard, Loki has words with the Gatekeeper, and since Heimdale is bound by service to not disobey the king, Loki instructs him to not let anybody in on the bridge. Thor, meanwhile, takes Eric back to Jane's caravan, and man, Eric is fucking wasted. 
Thor and Jane then have some bonding time, and Thor tells her the story of the Nine Realms. And also, it doesn't look like Jane was the only one catching feelings. Sif and the Warriors 3, meanwhile, bicker over Loki, and decide, screw it, we're gonna go find Thor ourselves. They're called in by the bridge keeper, though, and while Heimdall tells them that he cannot open the bridge for them, he didn't say anything about them doing it, and he leaves them the sword. Loki is super not cool with this, though, and decides, screw it, can't get something done, you have to do it yourself. And by do it yourself, I mean send a destroyer to do it for me. After having a hearty breakfast, Thor finally reunites with his friends. There they finally tell him of Loki's deception, and that his father is still alive. Speaking of deception, Loki's pretty pissed about Heimdall's. Loki promptly fires him, and no longer being in his service, Heimdall goes to attack, but Loki freezes him on the spot. Literally. Shit's going down back on Earth, though. It looks like there's a tornado. Oh, oh god, that's, that's not a tornado. Having no actual power, though, Thor and friends start helping the citizens get out of there, while Sif and the warriors decide to distract the destroyer. So much for them being mighty warriors, though, as they get their asses kicked by this thing. Having shed all his selfishness, Thor knows exactly what he needs to do. He bravely confronts the destroyer, which promptly kills him with the world's mightiest pimp hand. With this notion, though, Thor is finally once again declared worthy. The hammer returns to him, as well as all the power of the God of Thunder. And having his newfound power back, the Destroyer is no match as he gets swiftly wrecked. After this, Thor makes peace with S.H.I.E.L.D. and Colston, who agree to give Jane all her stuff back. Shit's going down back on Asgard, though, as Loki has let the Frost Giants in. Thor, Sif, and the Warriors try to beam up, but the bridge isn't open, as Heimdall's frozen in ice. Using the power of pure rage, though, he's able to break free of the ice, kill the Frost Giants, and open up the bridge. Saying his goodbyes to Jane, Thor promises that he will come back for her before beaming back up to Asgard. They might be too late, though, as Lothley's just about to do it. He's gonna kill Odin. Oh, shit, maybe... Wait, Loki stopped him? What the hell? Thor then confronts his brother, who promptly blasts him out of the room, and Loki reveals his true plans. He wants to destroy Jotunheim himself in order to appease Jotun and prove that he himself is worthy of being king. And Loki gets started on that pretty quick, as he uses a giant laser from the bridge to start fucking up the land of the Frost Giants. Thor arrives to confront him and initially refuses to fight him. Loki makes a comment about paying Jane a visit, though, and that was about enough to set him off. They fight under the bridge, which Thor wins by pinning Loki down with the hammer, which is a brilliant move, I gotta say. Thor then realizes there's only one way to truly stop the destruction of Jotunheim, and he grabs the hammer and starts destroying the bridge. Loki tries to stop him, though, but Thor is able to successfully destroy the bridge right before Loki can stab him. As a result of this explosion, they almost fall into space, but hey, look who's awake! Loki one last time appeals for his father's approval, but he is again rejected. Sensing that he will never get it, Loki lets go, and falls deep into the bowels of space. Back on Earth, Jane and friends somehow notice that the bridge is gone, and they leave all depressed and stuff. Thor is also depressed and stuff, but with their both combined efforts to see each other once again, the movie ends with the notion that they will. Time for this end credit scene, though, as Dr. Selvig is called to a lab by the one and only Nick Fury. We are for the first time shown the Tesseract, which Nick Fury wants Selvig to investigate to unlock its unlimited power. But here's the big twist. Selvig is secretly being controlled by Loki. And up to this point in Marvel, this was probably the most important end credit scene of all time, as it really set forward who the main villain was going to be in the Avengers. Now, yes, this isn't the strongest film in the franchise, and of course the running joke is now, hey, why watch the Thor trilogy when you can just watch Ragnarok three times? And while Ragnarok is great and Dark World is terrible, this movie is good, and it deserves to be looked at as such. After watching these movies in order, this movie just felt like a breath of fresh air. After a kinda eh Hulk movie, and then a crappy Iron Man sequel, this is really the boost the MCU needed. And we might as well get to the rankings, because I think it's pretty obvious where I'm going to put this. The current rankings entering today is as follows. Iron Man 1 number 1, Iron Man 2 number 2, and The Incredible Hulk last. And while I don't think this is a top tier movie like Iron Man, this is not a bottom tier movie like Iron Man 2 and The Incredible Hulk. This is a mid-tier movie, which is why I'm going to put Thor second best out of the first four films in the MCU. I think the common conception about Thor nowadays is, due to the success of the more comedy-induced character in Ragnarok and Fat Thor and Endgame and all that, that you can't really do this character as mythological. It doesn't really work. But I think this movie proves that conception wrong. While yes, Dark World was terrible, terrible to the point where it almost killed Chris Hemsworth's passion for the character, this movie was great, and if you have a good script, clearly the more mythological elements of the character can be done very well. 
And unfortunately, that second film may have been terrible because Kenneth Branagh, who directed this first movie, withdrew from the second project. Had he maybe stuck on, maybe Thor to Dark World wouldn't have been boring as all shit. So beloved to the point that Thor is actually going to be the first MCU character to get four films, as Thor Love and Thunder is currently in development. Natalie Portman is coming back for that one, and I'm not huge on her, like I said earlier, but then again, Thor is going to be in it, and Valkyrie is going to be in it, and the Guardians of the Galaxy are going to be in it, and Christian fucking Bale is going to be the villain, so I'm sure it'll be fine. So you might be thinking, okay, we started with a high tier movie in Iron Man. This followed up with two straight low tier movies in The Incredible Hulk and Iron Man 2. Now we've got a mid tier movie with Thor. Are we going to get another mid tier movie next? Well, actually yes, because just 11 weeks after this movie was released, they came out with another solid film, and the last solo film going into The Avengers. But we will save that for next time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to do it for my MCU look back at Thor. In conclusion, while yes, it's not as good as Ragnarok and it's only a mid-tier movie, not a high-tier movie, it's a hell of a lot better than Dark World, it's also a hell of a lot better than Iron Man 2 or The Incredible Hulk, and I would definitely recommend giving it a look. But I hope you guys enjoyed the review today. When the next MCU review will be, I am not sure, because next up, uh, next Saturday, these review videos come every single Saturday, we are looking back at Godzilla vs. King Kong. After that, it will either be the next MCU look back or the next Kong look back, but considering the next look back as a combined King Kong and Godzilla look back, I think the next MCU look back will be after that, so probably in two weeks. But again, join me back here next week for my review of King Kong vs. Godzilla. If you want to see any of my previous lookbacks, I've done a look back at Godzilla and Godzilla Raids again. Uh, also done one on King Kong and also ones on Iron Man, Iron Man 2, and The Incredible Hulk. You can find all those on my channel. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video today. If you want to follow any of my social media links, they're all down in the description. Thank you to all 36 my patrons for supporting my projects on both my channels. My name is Noah Taff. This has been my look back at Thor, and I'll see you guys next time.